It's Memorial Day weekend, and this is where we remember. I know that we do have quite a few veterans or those that have served in our church, but Memorial Day is to remember those that paid the ultimate price, that, that paid the price for the freedom that we have today. And I encourage you over the, over the weekend to make sure that you take some time to remember. Uh, I know that many of us have, have maybe relatives that truly paid the ultimate price for the freedoms that we have. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today is freedom and the temptations of freedom. Because you, you have to understand, freedom has a temptation to it. It has a temptation to forget the cost, to forget the price that was paid. Most everything that you and I enjoyed in this, in this life as Americans, we enjoy it because of the price someone else paid. That's not to say that, that many of you haven't paid a price, but the very freedom that we can gather like this in a building like this, somebody else paid that, that price for that freedom because I could tell you there's many places across the world, more than not, that don't enjoy this kind of freedom and can't enjoy this kind of freedom. So praise God for that. that but there's a temptation that we have that we forget those freedoms. And I wanna to talk to you a little bit about that today. We live in a privileged nation. If you have ever had the opportunity to travel abroad, we could talk about all day, we could talk about for weeks to come, weeks, months, all the problems in our nation. We could talk about all the situations. We could talk politics. We could, we could talk about all that. Can I tell you at the end of the day, we are a privileged nation. Compared to other nations, we're a privileged nation. We have freedoms. We have, uh, we have the ability to move and to act in ways that other countries could only dream of. It's all tied together by this, by this little document called the Constitution. And we forget that sometimes the, the price that was paid originally to even set up that document as, as a guiding document for a country, there were 56 men, 56 signers of that Constitution. And in that, these 56, uh, few of them were to survive very long after that. Five were captured by the British and tortured before they died. 12 had their homes sacked, looted, occupied by the enemy or burned. Two lost sons in the army. One had two sons captured. Nine of the 56 died in the war from its hardships or from its bullets. Whatever ideas you had of the men who met and signed that declaration, it's important that you remember certain facts about the men who made this pledge. I think this is interesting. They were not poor men. It wasn't like they had, they didn't have other options. They weren't poor. They were men of means. They weren't wild-eyed pirates. Arg, let's just do this because there's nothing else to do. It wasn't like that. They were men of means. Most were rich men. Most enjoyed ease and luxury. They were not hungry, but they were prosperous. That was the, the idea of these men who signed this document, but they considered liberty much more important than security. They considered their liberty much more important than security. You know, I wish, I wish as Christians we would grasp, grasp hold of that concept, that liberty in Christ, freedom in Christ is much more than security here and now. Because the things we live for, if it's just the here and now, we're missing a whole aspect of, of an eternal perspective because of Christ's freedom. We're talking about that today. They pledged their lives, these men, their fortunes and their sacred honor. They fulfilled their pledge. They paid the price. And they won not only their freedom, but yours and mine. Amen? They did that. We live in this country. There's, there's some sayings that came out of that time. One is this, John Quincy Adams, he said, you will never know how much it costs my generation to preserve your freedom. He says, I hope you will make good use of it. It's a powerful statement. Thomas Paine said, what we obtain too cheaply, we esteem too lightly. It is dearness only that gives everything its value. Heaven knows how to put a price upon its goods, and it would be strange indeed if so celestial an article as freedom should not be highly rated. Freedom. There's temptations to it, of which we will talk about today. I want to give you a story, familiar character to many, King David. 
King David, we don't have time to, to put all the details of the story together, but ultimately King David was a shepherd boy. He was a, an unknown figure, but God had bigger and greater plans for him that ultimately he becomes king of Israel. And we enter into that time where he's king, things are going along okay, but there was a, a point where it revealed a lack of faith. And for be, lack of a better way to put it, he kind of got comfortable in his own power and he wanted to... to put out a census to see how strong his army was. And in, and in doing this, it was actually uh, taken by God as you're not looking to me as your strength, you're looking to your people and your army as your strength. And, and he was therefore taking his faith from God and putting it in man. And, and God was not happy about it, so much so that there was going to be cursing coming to the nation. And, and David realizes this in the midst of putting forth this census and this, this count of the army and their power. And, and he goes forward with it, but at that point, there's this, this aha moment that I've done wrong. And he begins to repent. He begins to, to show sorrow towards God. And, and God lays forth a an, an ultimatum. And, and that's what we don't have all the time to get into. But, but coming through all of this, David is going to sacrifice to the Lord, which was the, the, the custom and the, and the time then. And as he is doing this, he comes to the place, there's this specific area, specific threshing floor where he is going to sacrifice. And it's owned by this gentleman. And, and the gentleman recognizes what's going on. He recognizes uh, what King David wants to do, he buys into it, he's, he's for it, and he says, my king, I, I'll give you everything. I'll, I'll give you the oxen, I'll give you everything for the sacrifice, the, the yokes, everything, the wood, I will give you everything for the sacrifice. It's yours, for you and for the, for the kingdom, for God. And it's interesting because sometimes freedom, we buy into it, we, 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 we're for it. There's a situation where everything is good, but can I tell you, freedom costs there's a cost attached to it. You've heard me say this many times. There's, you know, the gospel, the freedom we have in Christ, it's free, but it's not cheap. It's free, but it's not cheap. David recognizes this. In the midst of actually having done wrong, repenting, trying to get things right with God, he realizes this, and what seems like a, a great gesture you're going to give the sacrifices. You're going to give all this. You're going to provide for this. David recognizes this. And he says this. He says in 2 Samuel 24, 24, he says, No, but I will buy it from you for a price. I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God that cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. I, this story I just want to bring around because so many times we want the things of God but we don't want to pay the price. We want the things of God. We want him to work in our life, but we kind of forget that others have gone before us and have paved the way, and Christ himself has gone forth as an example and, and did what he truly didn't want to do, didn't desire to do, didn't have the emotional fortitude to say, yeah, yeah, let's do this. He, he just was compliant with the Father's will because that was the right thing to do and paid the price. And sometimes... The freedom that we have, we treat it as though it's cheap. And I want to challenge us today on that. I want to challenge us because that is a temptation of freedom. What's well, my freedom? It's my right. That's the nation we live in. You know, Jesus said this, in John 34, 38, Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, look up. Lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows, another reaps. I sent you to reap what that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Everything you and I have, everything that we, we experience and enjoy today, somebody else sowed into that. Somebody else sowed into that, but we get to reap it. We get to reap what others have sown. That's, that's freedom. That's the freedom. We have the freedom to do that, but that doesn't excuse us into not having a responsibility to sow as well. And that's, that, my friend, is where we are today. In our nation, 
in our, in our world. We have the opportunity as the church, the body of Christ, to be the greatest participants of reaping. Jesus said it way back then, the harvest, the fields are white for harvest. So we can harvest, we have this opportunity to reap, but we also have an opportunity to sow, and we have to remember that in all the freedoms that we experience. You know, a father was talking to his rebellious son, uh, and, and just, you know, his son, kind of free thinker, just, uh, and it's not necessarily anything wrong with that. But he's talking to him, and he said, you know, son, he said, uh, every person who lives in the United States of America is a privileged person. And the son replied, I disagree. And the father said, that's the privilege. That's the privilege. You see, you can have your opinion. I can have my opinion. We, that's our right in our nation. That's our freedom in our nation. But when it comes to the things of God, we have to be careful that we hold them very close, very dear, in such a way that we aren't owed this. We get to be a part of this. That Christ paid the price, the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. We have the privilege to disagree and we have the privilege to speak our mind. We have freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and the right to petition. And we have the freedom to hope and dream and pursue our dreams. Church, we got a lot of freedom. But here's the thing. Most people never know what freedom is until they lose it. Most people ne never recognize the freedom they have until they lose it. But the flip side of this is true as well, as most people, many people don't know what freedom is because they've never recognized it. They've never recognized it. The story this morning that we're going to kind of land in and, and, and illustrate is the story of the crucifixion, where, where Christ is on center stage being crucified on a cross between two thieves, between two men that the consequences of their life and their actions have brought them to a point in their life where, where the public deems necessary that their life should be ended. And here they are in the same predicament that is the one who can save their very soul, the one who could, who could change everything for them. And both of them, we're going to look at their stories and see how it plays out in light of the temptations of freedom that you and I have. And the first temptation I want to I want to talk to you about this morning is this idea of the temptation to force our freedom on others. The temptation to force our freedom on others. You know, what you've been given, what I've been given, was given to us in, in spiritual nature by Christ himself, provided through his work on the cross. Not just his death, but his resurrection. And Sometimes we want to force that on others. Can I tell you, the same choice that you had is the same choice they have. We have the choice to choose Christ or to reject him. Back to that picture of, of, of Jesus on the cross at Calvary. Each one of those thieves had the same choice to choose him or reject him. And we'll look at their responses later. I think I think of this scripture, Galatians 5.1 says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. You know, this temptation is to be set free, but to put this yoke on people around us. Well, you know, I have freedom in Christ, but you need to do this, and you need to do that. And you need, we have to be careful with our freedoms. We can be so passionate about it that we don't give them the same freedom that we had ourselves in coming to Christ. It's difficult sometimes. It's interesting to hear how some will explain what you need to do to be a Christian or what you don't need to do to be a Christian. We're going to see how easy it was in this picture of the thieves and Jesus. In Luke 23, 26, it says, And they led him away, this being Jesus. They seized one Simon of Cyrene, and who was coming in from the country and laid him and laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. You know, the, the scene, and, and for time's sake, people were all gathered into the city. There was another census going on. There was an account, an account happening of the population. 
and people had to go where, where they were registered at, much like a, a, a voting precinct. You had to go where you're, where you're registered. And people are coming in, and it says, Simon of Cyrene, He's coming to town. He's just doing what he needs to do. He's, he's doing his, his duty as a citizen. And all of a sudden, he gets caught up in a drama that I'm sure he didn't want to be in. Can I tell you the things of God oftentimes happen in our lives like that? We, we encounter a situation. We encounter a circumstance, and we go, God, I don't have time for this. I don't even like this. I don't know why this is happening. I mean, Simon of Cyrene, we don't, we don't know his thoughts. We don't know. But I can imagine as a human having to grab this cross that Christ himself is, is continually following under, falling under the weight of is he could easily go, I didn't choose this. I don't want this. I don't want this to happen. Can I tell you Christ himself had gone through those same feelings, those same emotions? Father, I don't want this cup. I don't want it. I don't want to have to go through this, but nonetheless, your will be done. There's times that God's going to put us in situations. He's going to bring us to points and moments where all we have is the ch in the choice is to simply be faithful to his call. It's simply to be faithful to the moment. And Simon of Cyrene, though he was being forced to carry the cross, sometimes this can play out in our life. And God brings into moments in our life where he just says, my child, my daughter, my son, carry the cross. Carry the cross. Carry it as a testimony of what I've done. Carry it, though you may not feel like it right now, just carry it. And in that moment, we can't just take up the cross and go, hey, I hope you appreciate this. You know, I don't think Simon of Cyrene was walking through the city going, hey, folks, I hope you appreciate this. I'm doing this. Jesus, I got his back. I'm all, he didn't understand what was going on. He didn't understand the New Testament, the Old Testament. He didn't understand the books of the Bible. Many of them hadn't even been written yet. He's just doing what had to be done. And sometimes our faith has to be that. That's your freedom. That's your freedom in Christ. And he'll strengthen you in that moment. It's not a forced issue. It's a freedom issue. Jesus said this in John 10, 17 through 18. He says, for this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. They didn't force this on Christ. He chose it. Can I tell you this? The things of God in your life and my life, God's not going to just force it on you. He gives you the opportunity to choose his way. And in that opportunity, in that freedom, you can choose his way or you can walk another way. But I can tell you, if you choose his way, there's blessing. If you choose another way, there's cursing. And it's that simple. It doesn't get any more difficult than that. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30 says this, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What God wants to place on people is different than sometimes what we want to place on people. And we want our freedom to almost be a burden. That's a, that's a temptation. Well, listen, you know, you have somebody in your life, we all do, little ornery. Maybe they're sitting next to you. Don't look. <laughs> you, have, you have those in your life that they want to pull your chain it's like they get up in the morning thinking, what can I do to disagree with you? It's like they go out of their way like there's points or stars or, or money for just being difficult. Anybody know like that? Anybody know someone like that? <laughs> I didn't ask you to raise hands. I've got hands being raised. That's wrong. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> We have to be careful that the freedoms that God has placed in our life, we don't impose those on somebody in such a way that God didn't design it. He gives everybody an opportunity at the cross. He gives everybody an opportunity at the moment to experience his freedom. Does that mean you don't offer correction or, or, or the truth or, or friendship in, in, in that nature? No, not at all. But we have to be careful the temptation of freedom 
is we want somebody to experience what we've experienced so badly that we take away their choice of experiencing that. And again, in a moment, we're going to come to that picture of the cross where the two thieves and Jesus are there. Second temptation is this, is the temptation to use our freedom for ourselves. Can I tell you that the freedom that Christ gives us is, is not just for us, it's for others to see. It's for others to see how we respond in the moment, to see how we live this thing we call faith in Christ, to live this thing we call Christianity or being a follower of Christ. In Luke 23, 39, one of the criminals, one of the criminals who were hanged railed at him saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself. I mean, here we have, we have Jesus in the middle. We have this thief over here going, if you're who you say you are, then why don't you, uh, you know, help yourself, help me, I mean, do something. I mean, the truth is that all of us have been in those moments in our life, God, if you're there, I mean, I need you to do something. I need you to, you know, show up. I need you to be real. I, I, need, to, I need to feel your presence. I need, and we have to be careful in those moments because we'll all hit those moments. It's not like you hit a, a level of maturity in the Lord that you're not gonna hit those moments. You're who you say you are. Why don't you do something about it? In his mind, in his heart, it was for selfish reasons. It wasn't in recognition. It was literally in questioning. It was what we might even call fire insurance. You know, maybe if you are who you say, whatever, you know, save me. I mean, do what you say you can do. The intent of the heart was not right. We have to be careful that we don't approach Christ with the words that sound right, but a heart that is absolutely wrong. Can I tell you, Christ doesn't save you to just save you. He saves you to use your life. If he was only wanting to save you and I, then at the point that we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, he'd just kill us and take us to heaven. Okay, they're saved, boom, all right, boom, all right, done, no. He saves us to use our lives. Now I could go into all the scriptures of now take up your cross and follow me. There's, there's an element of this gospel that though it is free, it is not cheap. It does cost us. It costs us the ability to be selfish. Freedom in Christ says, no, I'm selfless. I'm not selfish, I'm selfless. This isn't just about me. Oh, though I get to reap the benefits. It's about others. It's about those around me. And how I respond to what Christ has freely given me can affect their lives too. See, freedom's not just about you. It's about everyone. Or it's not freedom. Galatians 5.13 It says, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love, serve one another. I mean, that's a warning we've got to heed to. It says this, First Peter, it says, live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. I mean, none of this, our, our freedom in Christ, none of this, yes, you get the benefit, but if you miss the opportunity that this benefit is extended way before, way, way beyond you. You miss it. You miss it. And that's a temptation of freedom. Third temptation is this, temptation to deny our freedom. A temptation to deny our freedom. You say, well, pastor, what do you mean by that? You know, people will say, I've gone too far. I've gone too far. I just, you know what? I've got some things I need to clean up before I come to God. I've got some things I'm dealing with. And you know, when I get those dealt with, then then I can focus in on God and his plan for my life. But right now, I've had lengthy conversations on this over the years. People have come to me, and one in particular that I remember coming to me and literally in tears and saying, Pastor, I, I think I've gone too far. I've done some things that I don't think God would take me. I, I, really, I, I believe I've blasphemed the Holy Spirit, that I am, I'm unturnable, and, and I, I don't feel God anymore. And they're, they're crying. They're like, I just can't. And I go, well, here's the thing. You care about that, right? 
And they said, yeah, I, I don't want to go so far from God, but I feel I have. And I go, okay, because you care, you haven't gone far enough. Because you care, that means God's pulling you. That's God doing that. That's God showing you how much he loves you. What? Yeah, you can't come to God without God. We need God to come to God. You can't just go, you know what? I think today, yeah, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna follow the Lord. You can't do that. I can't do that. We need his Holy Spirit to draw us. Because if we could do it on our own, we wouldn't need him. So we need him. And he draws us and he pulls us in and he woos us. And so that conviction you're feeling, that, that idea that you're going, you know, I just, I don't think I can do this right now. I just don't think. That's that battle for freedom. Because Christ comes to us. And though we're horrible, the decisions we made are bad, the path we're on is wrong, the situation is hopeless, he can look at the most hardened sinner and say, today you'll be with me in paradise. We're gonna see that play it out at the cross. Scripture goes on. Luke 23, 39 through 43, one of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, do you not fear God? Since you are under the same sentence of condemnation, and we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Surely it's not that easy, church. I mean, this guy, he had lived his life so much so that the public believed he needed to die. The public believed that he had this coming. And here he is, the one thief is going, Jesus, if you are who you say you are, why don't you, why don't you fix this for me and you? And the other one's saying, listen, we deserve what we've done. I'm sure he wasn't some theologian and he had it all figured out. I'm sure he probably wasn't one that could quote the law. We don't know much about these thieves. I'm sure he wasn't one that was an eloquent speaker and really, in the moment, all he had, the only hope he had, as he stretched out on this cross, is, Jesus, I may not have it all figured out. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus didn't go, well, I'm sorry. But how you've been living, well, I'm sorry, but it's too late. I mean, you don't even have time to get water baptized. You don't have time to go through some catechism. You don't have time, no. It's done, buddy. Jesus didn't do that. I tell you, today you'll be with me in paradise. See, freedom in Christ isn't something that you and I can earn. He paid for it. I mean, he paid for it. You and I, didn't pay for it. He paid for it with his life. And we sang about it. Then the battle raged over death, hell, and the grave. And he won. And he conquered it. So much so that you can make the most horrible decisions in your life. You can make the most blatantly obvious wrong things, wrongdoings. But at the end of it all, you can approach Christ. God, I have nothing to give you. Christ, I've done everything wrong. I've abused everything and every opportunity you've given me. I don't deserve this. Will you remember me? And he goes, I love you. I have a plan for you. If you'll just trust me. Every single person in this place, you're alive, you're breathing. You're alive, you're breathing, there's hope. I mean, time was running out. This guy on the cross over here, he recognizes the power in Jesus. He recognizes the opportunity. He's not going, you know what? But when things get better, Lord, I, you know, I, I would give it up right now, but look at me. You know what I mean? I'm paying for my sins and I deserve this and I understand this and I, you know. 
Time's ticking, time's running out. But, you know, I'll just give it a little, little more time. I need to think about it. I need to, you know, maybe, maybe there's some things, maybe, maybe there's some people around here I need to apologize to. I just, you know what, once I take care of that, and life's leaving him, and life's leaving him, and there's this urgency. We get it in that scenario. Why do we change things around in our own scenarios? Why do we go, you know, God, I just, you know, once I get this figured out, once I take care of this, once I do, once I... No, there's an urgency, church. And that's the freedom that Christ offers. And the temptation is to deny that freedom. And when you say, well, I know God could forgive me, but I could never forgive myself, you're putting yourself above God. And that's a place none of us are designed to be. But God, I could never, I, I, would, nev I would never expect... I do not deserve your, can I tell you, nobody does. Yeah, but what I've done, it doesn't matter. You've heard me say it, the scripture says it. Your best day, your righteousness, the day you're feeling close to God, the day you feel like you've got things straight, and yes, I can approach the throne of God. I can approach the, the ground at Calvary. I can approach what Christ has done, what Christ has paid. The day you're feeling it, your righteousness is a filthy rag. That's the day you're feeling it. Can I tell you, your righteousness in feeling close to God, in feeling, he paid that price for that freedom. For you to come to the cross, just like the hardened sinner, the one who recognizes, way, I've gone too far, I've gone too far, I've gone too far. Can I tell you, you can't go far enough from the love of Christ. He'll draw you in. He paid the price for that freedom. Don't deny it. Don't deny it. In closing this morning, many of you have heard the understanding of what's called the Romans Road. It's, it, it's in the book of Romans. It's this idea Paul presents uh, of what it is to be saved, how it is to be saved. And, and oftentimes people will use these scriptures to, to walk people through the reality of humanity and, and how every person is, is, is sinful and needs a savior. Every person who's born needs a savior. They need a, a recognition that we need God. It's not like somebody's born and they don't need God and this one's born and they do need God. No, we all need God. That's why an ultimate price, an ultimate sacrifice had to be made. Because the wages of sin is death. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's three concepts here. Number one, in rejection. Two, in reception. Three, in redemption. I want to give you that picture again. Jesus on Calvary. He's dying here. He's here not on his own accord. He's here because of you and I. He's here because of the sins of the world. He's here because he is the only solution. He's not a solution. He's the solution. He's the one and only. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. No one comes to the Father except through him because of what he did on Calvary. He didn't just die, but he rose from the dead. Here he is. He's dying between two thieves who absolutely deserve what they're getting. They absolutely deserve what is happening to them. And the one is looking at Jesus, what he has to offer, in the same situation going, you're no different than me. But if you are who you say you are, why don't you help me and you? And he's looking at the same situation, and it's in rejection. And then you have this other thief. And he's on the other side of Christ. And he's looking at the same thing the other thief is looking at. He's in the same situation as the other thief. And he's looking at it with reception. This idea that I deserve what I've got coming. I, I get that. I don't like it, but I get it. But Jesus, if you just remember me. Because that's all I got right now. Just remember me. Just think about me when you come into your kingdom. I realize who you are. There was a confession with his mouth who Jesus was. Romans tells us 
In Romans 10, 9, 10, and 13, it says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Here's what's interesting. Christ hadn't died yet. Hadn't died yet. But he recognized who Jesus was, what was happening, what was doing, what was going down that day. And Jesus said, you know what? He could have said it this way. I realize you don't have it all figured out. Matter of fact, it all hasn't played out yet. But I tell you what, today you'll be with me in paradise. You may be sitting sitting in this seat this morning and you're going, I just wish I could figure it all out. I just wish. When you figure it out, will you come meet with me? When you figure it out, maybe you can enlighten the rest of us because I can tell you, if you have it all figured out, your name is three letters, God. Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, will you just remember me? And Jesus says, today, you'll be with me in paradise. All in the midst of him paying this price that you and I owed, taking upon himself all the sins of the world for all time from beginning to end encapsulating what this man's life represented and saying, you know what it's all good i'm going to pay it i don't want to pay it i don't like this i mean he didn't nonetheless it's my father's will and it's the only way and i love you that much that's freedom So when you ever think that the freedom you have in Christ is about you, you're missing it. It's about others. It's about what Christ did for you to give you the ability to go through whatever you have to go through, to endure whatever you have to endure, but he'll be with you always to the end of the earth. Can I tell you, everything we know and everything we're about will pass away, but his love and his word will stand forever. And what he's done for you and for I, And I'm telling you, huh, priceless, priceless, but it's free, but it's not cheap.